Welcome, welcome to the Rick Helps Real Estate Show, special election edition. The morning after, how's everybody feeling? 50% of you are thrilled, 50% of you are ticked off. But we talked about what kind of effect is this going to have on the real estate market? People were waiting, not going to buy a house, not going to sell a house, going to wait till after the election. Well, it's done. So now what? <laughs> what decisions are you going to make? What changed? Let me know in the comments. Here's where we're at. Stock market's having a heck of a good day. Now, I kind of jokingly said the stock market always goes up the day after election because they're just damn glad it's over. Uh, but we're up 1,388 points right now. That's pretty significant. Pretty big jump. Probably go down tomorrow. So who knows? It's uh, You never know how this all shakes out. Here's the one that's a bit of a surprise uh, to me and many of us in the industry, and that is a Interest rates are going up. This is a 10-year treasury right here. It's having a really bad day. And it's uh, showing up in mortgage rates, um, sitting here at 7.13. Now, I don't think anybody could have told you um, that if one person or the other wins, that we were going to see a big reaction in the bond market. So the Fed meets tomorrow on the 7th to announce whether they're going to lower rates again. The betting market saying, yeah, they're going to go down 0.25. Um, but yet here we go, you know, the bond market saying it's almost like a vigilante movement by bond traders saying, you know, Hey, we, here's where we think the, the direction's going. The one thing to glean out of that for those of you that are buying or selling homes is look, there's nobody out there, your best lender in the world, your best realtor that can predict where mortgage rates are going up and down in the short term. It's kind of relatively easier to say where it's going to trend over the next six months. But these spikes up and down during the week are really hard to spot. And uh, you can look at trend analysis and you can look and see that it hit a floor on the graph and that's called technical analysis. So you can kind of do some of that. And a lot of the good lenders really spend a lot of time taking a look at that and seeing if there's a window of an opportunity. And, uh, you know, if you get it right 75% of the time, <clears throat> that leaves the window open that you're going to be wrong 25% of the time. So bottom line is nobody's good at this. And uh, today's a classic example. I think if you were to survey everybody uh, a couple of days ago, what do you think rates are going to do the day after election if uh, Trump wins? I don't think they could have given you an answer. And uh, yet the market is giving us an answer. Um, there's a lot of noise behind it. I don't know, but that's what has changed. So maybe some of you that are waiting until after the election to make a purchase probably did a wise choice by saying, well, I'm going to wait and see what happens. Although you would have got a lower rate a few weeks ago, or you would have got a much lower rate in September. Um, so now you're waiting and going, is this going to stick? Is this going to get better? What's happening to the market? Now in looking at some of the numbers, and this is, this is hard to read. So I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit about what they're seeing here. And it said, what's interesting that I want to touch on is foreclosures. There were 416 residential foreclosure notices in Maricopa County in October. This is the highest monthly total since February, 2020. Now, before you get all giddy, say, oh boy, here they come. There's a little devil in the details here. For context, this would have been considered a low number prior to 2020. And October did have a high number of, days, number of days for trustees to file, 23. But there's no denying we're seeing a rising trend in notices. Well, who's doing this? Well, quite a few of the notices are for hard money loans taken out by fix and flip investors who are now having trouble selling the property they borrowed against. Interest rates for hard money loans are very high. They're called hard for a reason. So borrowers can be quick to give up and allow the property to go into foreclosure rather than come up with the high monthly repayments. These are not very numerous, but it shows that fix and flips investment activity can sometimes be risky as well as sometimes rewarding. So what's hard money? Hard money, let's say I got a house I want to buy and, and uh, it needs a lot of work. And I go in and say, I'm going to be able to get this for 350000 So you go to a hard money lender and say, um, I'm going to buy this for 350000 but I'm going to need 100000 to spruce it up. So I'm into it for 450000 Plus, I'm going to have some carrying costs, some interest rates, I mean, some uh, commission payments, et cetera. So I need to borrow 
five hundred thousand dollars, and uh, and then they fix it up. They sell it for four seventy five. And they make a quick twenty five thirty thousand dollars. Everything's great. Well, the hard money loans are considerably higher interest rate than you're seeing. So in fact, they're probably ten percent. But they figure that into the cost of remodeling the house. So they borrow the money. They go, this is a high payment. I may only have to make two or three of them, put it in their spreadsheet, make it a part of their analysis. And what they're finding out is that flip sitting on the market a little too long. They're going, man, I got to get out from underneath this loan. So there are a handful of them walking away, enough of them to where it spikes the numbers, but there isn't enough to where you can honestly say that we're running into a general foreclosure crisis or a spike or an increase when you look at the numbers, especially when you compare it to what's normal. They're still operating below normal. So again, you're going to see headlines of a high percentage increase. Again, a high percentage of a low number is still a low number. Some of the other things that we're seeing here, this is new listings uh, coming up. Active listing counts by day. See how they just go up and down, up and down, up and down. So it's gone down again on the 5th of November. That's yesterday. Um, and it will go up and down. So there's really nothing significant going on with new listings, active listings, I mean. But with new listings that I track on my seven-day moving average, I'm seeing a decrease. I'm seeing that new listings coming on is getting lower. Um Part of that is because at the end of the month, we had a lot of expired listings, about 750. So when I track how many new homes came on the market, how many went back on market, and then I subtract canceled listings because they're no longer available. Then I subtract expired listings because they're no longer on the market. I get a total number of new listings for that week. That number is lower by about 400 homes this week. And I owe that all to expired listings. People that put their home on the market, they just let it expire. It didn't work. I couldn't get a buyer. Sales, number of contracts written on a weekly basis has not moved much. It's only moved down by about 50 homes, but it's still kind of trudging along down on the floor. It's not brisk. It's not dead. It's mostly dead. Remember the movie Princely Br Princess Bride? It's not dead. He's mostly dead. This is an interesting one here. We talked about contract ratio. In other words, homes between 405, 000, uh, 39% of them are getting a contract compared to last year, 49% of them were going under contract. But the interesting number to follow is the following are showing an increase in their contract ratio between 1.5 and 2 million and 5 million to 7, 5 million. And I have seen an increase of act inactivity in the $1.5 to $2 million range. So that is doing okay. Uh, about 50% of it is cash, so they're not as affected by interest rate moves. The other price points between four and 800000 interest rates affect them greatly, so it's not uh, going well for them. This is a chart that I like to show. It still hasn't been updated yet, so I'm going to show you a little detail. It's showing the blue line, which is the number of listings there as a ratio. And then the, the red line is demand. So we're getting more supply and less demand. If I get in and I look at the detail behind it, I can see that here's our demand. It's gone up a little bit. And the demand index has it at 76.7. So it has climbed just a hair. And a lot of that is due to the interest rates going down in September. That's going to curve as we're into October now. Now I look at supply. And supply has gone up. So you got supply at index at 85. So it's 79 versus 85. That is going to exert downward pricing pressure. And that happens when you have more supply than demand. Now, are we going to see anything that says our demand is going to change throughout the rest? Of I got an itch right here. Uh, demand's going to change the rest of the year. Personally, I don't see it. Um, October is always kind of not too bad. September is usually a good time to sell every year. Um, then it winds down. We get into Thanksgiving, we get into Christmas. Real estate agents are finishing their continuing education classes because there's not a lot going on. And then, bam, things reignite in January. The only good news about elections being done now is those campaign signs can finally come off the intersections. And realtors, people will now notice your open house sign. That's always kind of a challenge. <laughs> it's just you just drive through intersections. You don't even want to see what's on the corner. 
I got now you can go, oh, there's an open house. Saw another number here showing that the number of funded treasury <coughs> treasury direct accounts moved up when the Fed started raising interest rates. In other words, you're saving your money. People are loading their guns. They're waiting. They're going to put it in treasuries. They're going to get higher interest rate. They're going to park it there for a while, and they're going to wait. And it's really evident that you can see here that the amount of money that people, you know, there's a, here's the effective funds rate here, and here's the treasury accounts. Now, they went down a little bit now, a little bit, probably because people are pulling money out of their, their accounts. So that's kind of uh, a number to watch. Um, not closely, it doesn't really mean anything for the individual, but it's just, as you look at the group of potential buyers, they're saving their money. The overall savings rate for the United States is starting to come down. I don't know what it is for Arizona. I don't dive into that number of price changes per week. You can see it went down a little bit, uh, on the week of October 27th. And I will guess that that's probably going to be the same for this week because everybody's waiting for after the election. Now that the election's over, what do we expect to see next week? I think it'll probably pop back up a little bit because people are going to be, you're under the gun now if you're selling. So you've waited for the election. The buyers have waited for the election. Many people think the buyers are going to come back out now that the election's over, uh, regardless of which party would, would win. The anxiety should be behind us. We know where we're headed. I'm not seeing that spike coming. So if you're sitting there on your house and you weren't getting a lot of movement before the election, you're not going to get a lot of movement after the election unless you price your home accordingly. According to everything that we're seeing in the Cromford reports, unless your house is a bargain, you're probably not going to get any offers that you like. Except up here in one of the hottest markets in Arizona, 86005, um, the hottest market zip code in Arizona isn't the Phoenix market, rather a couple hours north in Flagstaff. That's according to the Business Journal's hottest housing market rankings, which is based on third quarter listings and sales from Intercontinental Exchange. The rankings are intended to emphasize sales and price momentum in U.S. zip codes using a weighted formula included quarterly year-over-year -year data. So, Average home sale prices in this zip code have spiked 173% since 2019. If you have been up at Flagstaff at all and you've looked at the prices, I think their average price in Flagstaff is well over 675000 It's not a whole lot of room to build up there, and uh, it's gone crazy. So we are sitting here in Phoenix going, man, we are priced out. So now you can say, well, at least I'm not in Flagstaff trying to buy in Flagstaff. I do get a lot of inquiries from out of state saying, I'm, I'm interested in buying land or buying something up in Flagstaff. What are your thoughts? And I just have to tell them, well, it's expensive and it's windy and it's cold. It's very popular in the summertime, uh, kind of rough up there in the, in the wintertime. But if you like to ski, that's the place for you. I used to work up in Flagstaff a lot in my other career and, and uh, loved going up there in the summer. And I just prayed in the winter that I didn't need to go up there in the winter time to see how things are going. It's like, I don't want to go. So that's what's going on in our market. Did things change like you thought they would? Did uh, uh, don't, don't weigh in on whether or not your favorite person won or lost. Uh, that just makes everybody start arguing. But uh, where do you think the market's headed next month. Let me know in the chat section. Do me a favor and hit that like button. Have a great night. Take care.